Hello, everybody. It's that time to get started. Are we ready? Woo! Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah. We thank you so much for the Hebrew language and for the insights that we can learn from it. We would have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. Father, that we would be able to grasp it, even though it's not difficult, Father. We, we want to be able to really get a hold of it. So I pray that you would just bless the people here, and we bless you in Yeshua's name. Amen. I was just passed a little note. Do you have a handout that lists the root letters with their Hebrew meanings? Okay. And uh, I, I think I do. I think I actually have a book with them all. And uh, I'll have to go back to my office and, and look. I have a lot of, tons of books. And um, I have some books I'm going to recommend tonight that weren't on your book list. As far as things, we're not necessarily going to study them, but they're phenomenal books that I recommend. And so we're going to look at that too. But uh, to start with tonight, what we're going to talk about is the community of Torah. I think it's so important that we realize we're in a community. Let me see. <clears throat> Here I have an airport. How many of you have ever been to an airport? You know, all the people in line. Here you have a whole bunch of people. They're all together, but are they a community or just a bunch of different people going different directions? Well, I think that's a problem with the church today, so to speak. It's a bunch of people going all different directions. And there's a real lack of community, a, a real lack of people that, you know, are caring for each other. And let me ask you this. How many of you ever had a bad experience in a church? Okay. I tell you what, friendly fire is pretty bad, you know, sometimes in the church. Uh, but at the same time, you know, in a family, how many of you get hurt in your own family? <laughs> I mean, that's sometimes just the nature of it. But the thing is, even as it says in Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, you know, especially as you see the day approaching. Well, I think we need to realize we need to be a community. And, and when you're more than just a, a bunch of isolated individuals, your community, what does that mean? You're going to what? You're going to care for each other. And what we have to realize is God did not want a spiritual army of lone rangers. Okay, sometimes people may appear as spiritual lone rangers, but we also have to realize they're not. Maybe they have legitimate reasons. And I'll give you one good example is uh, of one of the hindrances to participating in a community. Maybe there's none available. Maybe you are out in the pucker brush and there just isn't anybody there. We find this in the Hebrew roots movement all the time. We have people say, oh my goodness, I'm here. There is, you know, and so that's what El Shaddai wants to be. We want to be your community, people that you can, that are like-minded and care for each other. And it was amazing to, uh, tonight, or today, I should say, I think it was, I don't know, maybe been, I think it was about 10 or 11 this morning. Uh, Tina is on the computer and she's getting instant messaging from a soldier in Iraq and it's about nine o'clock at night. And he ends up calling. So I hear I'm talking to this soldier in Iraq on the phone, just encouraging him. He's a young kid. He was only 19 years old or something like that. But he loves Torah. He loves the God of Israel. He loves uh, El Shaddai, listening all the time. And he said he can hardly wait till he's from Oklahoma. But he said when he gets out, he's moving up here and wants to be a part of our community. But I just think it's so neat that we can uh, let people know all over the world all different countries, even soldiers in Iraq, that, hey, you're part of something bigger than yourself. You're part of a whole group. Uh, we love each other. We care for each other. And to me, that's, that's really important. But that's why I think we have the internet community, too, you know, which I think uh, that I really think is a fantastic way to make people feel they're not alone. The other thing that I find is sometimes there may be other Messianic communities or other churches or other people or whatever, but sometimes you wonder, is it a safe community? Okay, and that's why we have people also. Do you know of any congregations that are like yours in our area, you know? And sometimes I'm scared to death to tell them, you know? I say, man, you really have to check it out yourself if you want to go because just like there's a lot of unsafe churches, there's a lot of unsafe uh, messianic movements that's out there too. And so you really have to be careful. And so that's another reason why people may feel alone is because they don't feel safe. And that's one of the reasons why we started El Shaddai too is we wanted to create a safe place where uh, we, we're not here to lord over the flock or be anyone's Holy Spirit or be manipulative or controlling. 
you know, people come, people go. Uh, the doors open at both ends. And, we, you know, we just kind of set things out like a buffet and uh, take what you want, leave what you don't want. But uh, there's a, a great book, and I'm going to put it up. We used to sell it. We ran out. We don't have any more. But here's a book that I highly recommend. It's called The Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse. And it's about the spiritual abuse that's in the church. Okay, basically. Uh, there are abusive pastors out there, okay? Uh, there's also abusive people out there that abuse their pastor, okay? It goes both ways. But uh, this book is an incredible book. So if you are a victim of uh, some authoritarian uh, spiritual abuser, I highly recommend this book so that you can overcome uh, what you have been through. But spiritual abuse occurs when a leader uses their spiritual position to control or dominate another person. That's basically what it is. Some of that, want, they want to control you and dominate you, and so they use their spiritual authority <clears throat> to do that. Uh, the power is used to bolster the position or needs of the leader over the one who comes to them in need. In other words, the sheep come to the shepherd, and the shepherd is more concerned about getting his needs met and how that sheep can meet their needs rather than trying to meet the needs of the people. <clears throat> but like I said, the people can also spiritually abuse their leaders as well. But the other thing to remember is this. Also, just because a leader and a congregant doesn't get along doesn't mean that there's spiritual abuse going either direction. Sometimes it's just personality conflict and it's nothing to do with spiritual abuse. So you can't assume that it's always spiritual abuse either. Uh, <clears throat> but the thing I want us to realize is God has always wanted community where Torah could be lived out. That's the way you learn, okay? And we're all going to stumble. We're all going to fall. We're all going to make mistakes. We all, uh, I mean, I think, I think everyone knows we're all dysfunctional guys, <clears throat> okay? Uh, we, I mean, that's just the way it is. I don't know anyone that's been raised in necessarily a perfect environment. And so we, uh, we learn as we go, but that's the way you learn. Uh, Torah, when you think about it itself, it was given to a community. It was given to a nation. It wasn't just given to an individual. It was given to a nation all at once. We see in Exodus 24, 3, it says, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And then it says, and all the people answered with one voice. So here you have all the people answering with one voice. They were unified. They were one community. Uh, and they all said, <clears throat> all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And what's important to realize when you look at the, what the Torah talks about, many of the Torah's teachings can only be fulfilled in the context of community rather than as an individual. I mean, some people think well, it was just me and Jesus or something like that. <clears throat> but you know, just you and Jesus is not good. When you think about it in Genesis, when God kept saying everything is good in Genesis 1, the first not good was that man should be alone. Even though God himself was there with Adam, God said, it's not good that it's just Adam and me. Think about that. We, we really do need each other. And uh, when you look at the Torah's teachings, it talks about court systems. Okay, well, that can only be done in the context of a community. Uh, emancipa emancipating people who are in debt. Uh, how about the festivals, all the sacred assemblies, when everyone comes together? Well, you don't have 6,000 groups of one, okay? Uh, everyone's coming together. But here's the other thing to realize. There is a special presence of God in the midst of a community of believers. Remember even in the New Testament, when two or three are gathered. So there's a special presence of God that's there when we're all together, that's not there when we are by ourselves. Uh, so it's not always realized by the individual. Psalms 82 and verse one, it says, God stands in in the congregation of the mighty. So God wants to be where? In the congregation with everyone. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at some of the names of the believing community or the Torah community. And one of them is the called out community. And one of the things that I wanted to bring out, when we think of the word called out, look at Genesis 1, 2, and 3. We see when God created the world, the earth was without form and void and darkness 
was on the face of the deep. And then the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. So here we see out of darkness, God called forth the light. But it's also important to realize the darkness in our own life. We say, oh, I'm so bad. I, I am so dark. There's no hope. But no, it was in the darkness that God called the light out. So there's always hope. And in Exodus 12, 6, I want you to notice this. It says when he's referring to the Passover lamb, he says, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So here again, we see the idea of community, the whole assembly. And the Hebrew word for assembly is kahilah. And the Greek word for that in the Septuagint is ekklesia or ecclesia. It's the same word. That's also important. And that's why, personally, I don't like the word church. Not that I'm against the church. But when you hear the word church, all you think of is some New Testament steeple someplace. And so it really doesn't paint the right picture. That's why I like using the term congregation myself. Or you can use the word uh, kahila. But for me, I don't like using the word church. Not that I'm against the church, but it implies something that I don't believe is part of the original text. <clears throat> but here, look at this. Here God called light out of the darkness in Genesis 1. Well, let's look at Exodus 14, 19 and 20. Here we see the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it became between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these so that the one came not near the other all night. So here we see, just like God called light out of darkness, God called Israel out of the darkness of Egypt. So Israel was to be a light to the nations. So you see the same pattern of Egypt is darkness, Israel's the light being called out of the darkness, just like in Genesis one. So I want you to see this pattern that's gonna be repeating. Look at 1 Peter two, verse nine. It says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Then it says this, you're a peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of him who has called you, what? Out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we see the pattern uh, of creation where God called light out of darkness. Then we see in Moses' time, he called Israel as a light out of the darkness of Egypt. And now he's saying to us today, we are to be the light that is coming out of the darkness. A peculiar people. Well, where did this concept of a peculiar people in the New Testament come from? Well, let's look at Deuteronomy 14.2. Here, God says to Israel, to the Jewish people, you are a kadosh, a holy people unto the Lord your God. And what does kadosh mean or holy? It really means to be what? Separate. Separate. Okay. He says, you're a holy people to the Lord and the Lord has chosen you to be a peculiar people. There's that phrase. To himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. And then Deuteronomy 26, 18. It says, and the Lord has the vow you this day to be his peculiar people as he has promised you and that you should keep all of his commandments. So what is it that makes us a peculiar people? Keeping his commandments. If you throw out his commandments, you're no longer a peculiar people. You're common like everybody else. So when God says to be holy, how are you holy? By being separate from the rest of the world and keeping his commandments. So when we throw out the commandments and say, Errol, the Torah is done away with, you just left your peculiarity and now you're common like everybody else. And then look at Deuteronomy. Or no, now we're back to uh, Exodus uh, 19, verse 5 and 6. It says, now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. And you will be a, to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and these are the words which you shall speak unto the children of Israel. Okay, so you can see here from these verses that we're, that we're to be like light out of darkness. Okay, we're to be a peculiar people. What makes us peculiar is the fact that we uh, follow Torah, understand Torah. And I want you to see what's important to realize is that it's a continuation Okay, it's not like there was, there is the church which is a light and Israel which is a light. It's not like there's two lights that have come out of darkness. 
Okay, it's one group, and we're all part of that same group. And you're gonna see that more in just a minute. <laughs> Besides being a called out community, and you can see how this ties together, we're also to be a holy community. Look at Jude uh, chapter one, verse three. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which is once delivered unto the saints. Okay, so here, wait a minute. Who were the saints then? The Jewish people. You don't have to die to be a saint. Okay, as a matter of fact, saints are more useful alive. And I want you to notice that like when Paul wrote to Ephesus, he didn't write to all the sinners in Ephesus. He wrote to all the saints in Ephesus, okay? So there's nothing wrong if you're called out, then that means you are set apart, you're holy, and you're a saint, and you're alive. And you don't have to do three miracles first to be called one. As a matter of fact, when you think of the word saint, okay, I don't know if you know this, but unless, until I read that verse, do you really think of saints in the Old Testament? Or, or do most people think of New Testament saints? Very few people think of Old Testament saints. There, weren't, there weren't any saints in the Old Testament, there were a bunch of Jews, okay? Do you know the word saint in the Torah and in the Tanakh appears 34 times? There were all kinds of saints. As a matter of fact, look at in the Torah, Deuteronomy 33, verse 3 and 4. It says, yea, he loved the people. All of his saints are in your hand. They sat down at your feet. Everyone will receive of your words. Moses commanded us a Torah, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And then again, look at Psalm 149.1. It says, praise you the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. And his praise is in the congregation of the saints okay so i want you to think of this as the the uh, congregation of saints and so the thing that we need to see is the continuity of the called out holy ones of the tanakh and the called out holy ones of the brit hadashah or the new testament there are not two called out communities or two holy ones but one continuous community did you get that i mean that is really important I'm gonna show you uh, another thing. Here, here's the nations, okay? And what did God do to Israel? He said, I am going to separate you from the nations. So this represents greater Israel. Now they were physically redeemed, okay? By the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. They were physically redeemed. But if you remember, you have Enoch, who came long before Abraham, who was of the nations. You have Abel, okay? You have Noah. There were many people who were not, you know, they were long before, they were of the nations that were redeemed spiritually, okay? And there were Jews who were redeemed spiritually. But here was what I'm showing you by this picture is God separated the nation of Israel, called them out, they were physically redeemed. But what you have here, you also have the remnant. The remnant has always been there. Those are people who have been spiritually redeemed and they are made up of people from the nations. You have both the Jews and the non-Jews. So here there's, there's one tree and they are people that are spiritually redeemed Jews and spiritually redeemed Gentiles. And the Gentiles don't necessarily become Jews okay, from a genealogical standpoint, but they do when it comes to faith, okay? Think of Jewishness not only as a people, but as a faith. And so here you, you're gonna have people from all, both the nations and from Israel that make up the spiritually redeemed community, okay? Those are the spiritual redeemed, but there's not like a Jewish spiritually redeemed group and over here a separate Gentile spiritually redeemed group. That's what, that's what the common church thinking is. Or they almost think the spiritually redeemed Jews are grafted into this spiritually redeemed Gentile nation. No, we're grafted into them. And it's one tree, one community. So now let's look at 
Um, I have here, ancient Israel was redeemed from physical slavery to Egypt by the blood of the lamb. So the people of God are redeemed from spiritual slavery to sin also by the blood of the lamb. There were always those Jews who were both physically and spiritually redeemed. And there have always been Gentiles who were spiritually redeemed. So we see that um, we're a called out community. We're a holy community. We're a redeemed community. And we're also a covenant community. Uh, They are people who are in covenant with God. Uh, That is the essence of the Torah. And by accepting the covenant, Israel agreed uh, to treat each other in accordance with the stipulations of the covenant. Does that make sense? If you're in covenant, you're going to treat people according to the covenant. So again, if, if you do away with how you're supposed to treat people in the Torah, well, that means you can treat people that you're in covenant with any way you want to. Well, does it make sense? <clears throat> Both the Tanakh and the Brit Hadashah define what it means for God's people to live in covenant relationship with each other. So we have the Torah community. Now, what is a better word for Torah definition other than law, teaching or instruction? So in other words, Torah, a Torah community is to be a teaching community. They taught the word of God. So let's take a look at some of the characteristics of the believing community or the Torah community. They are people of the book, okay? They study, teach, and they live the Bible. Do you know that many of the top-selling Christian books are fictional or about spiritual experiences and feelings? If you were to Google the top 10 Christian books, I mean, a few years ago, it was the Left Behind series. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, so it's like these people have... Christians, they're not interested in reading the Bible. They're interested in all these experiences and fiction and feelings. This is horrible. The top 10 books won't even be about the Bible among Christians. As a matter of fact, that reminds me of an email I got uh, today. No, it wasn't an email. It was a letter. So I was holding it in my hand, I believe. Anyway, it kind of talks about this. I'm not going to read the whole letter. But this gives you an idea of some of the mail that we get. This is from a a gentleman who says that he's been a Sabbath keeper anyway for more than 25 years. And he says he was a a Seventh-day Adventist for many years. And he says, until I realized that when truth is found, that even then deception can find its way into the doctrine of any group that is ignorant of the Hebrew roots of Christianity. And uh, I thought this was interesting. He said... I personally have come to believe that any Christian church or group that discounts in any way the teachings of the Torah is like someone seeking to see in the dark but refusing to open the door to let the light in. Now, then uh, he goes on to say he lives uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, and he says, uh, I've watched most of your sessions with your assembly online, and I know without a doubt that what you're saying is the closest to the truth that I've ever found as far as being enlightened to God's word, and I pray God's blessing on you and your house for it. He says, now I can't come up to Tacoma every Sabbath from Arizona, <laughs> as much as I would really like to. Okay, but so he wants to know if there's a group down there. So it's the same situation. Hey, I'm down in Arizona. Is there a group that's like yours you can send me to? And uh, he says the situation is his, uh, he is really into Hebrew roots, his wife goes to an assembly of God church and the pastor is trying to convince his wife and to tell him, go ahead, go somewhere else. Go on your way, get out of here. Okay. And um, it says, and some of you will relate to this. He says, when I go to Sunday school, the pastor always says that the law is dead and makes a special point of letting me know and hear that every Sunday. It's almost as if he takes pleasure in poking me with a little snippet once a week. And whenever I say something and the folks start listening, then he stops it right away. Uh, but anyway... He says the head pastor, he's talked to him. He really likes him. He believes he knows what I'm saying is true, but it it really makes him uncomfortable. And now here comes the the funny thing that he says. This is going to be a little bit humorous. He goes, here's how he tries to explain it. He says, I understand the situation. He's aligned himself with the assembly franchise and has a lot to lose if he opens his eyes. So he prefers the dark. And uh, he says it's diagnosed as the I have too much to lose syndrome. So here's how he says it. Let's say I'm the minister of the Burger King faith. I believe Burger King hamburgers are the only way to nirvana. So I go to Burger King seminary. 
I find my future wife at the Burger King College for advanced studies. I get married to her while I'm studying there. I spend a fortune at the Burger King Institute for Spiritual Advancement, and lo and behold, I graduate. I get my first position as youth minister at, you guessed it, Burger King Congregation of Tacoma. And then, uh, you know, he goes on and uh, he says, then one day someone tells me that Burger King hamburgers are not the real thing. And I've been wrong all these years. And that Kentucky Fried Chicken is the truth because it's lower in cholesterol and saturated fats. <laughs> and he says that Burger King food is really bad for people and Kentucky Fried Chicken is the true spiritual food that people need. And so I, as the pastor of my congregation, the Burger King Church, see the truth and start selling Kentucky Fried Chicken at the congregation of the Burger King Church. How long do you think that will last? Okay, and uh, so anyway, so he just kind of goes on and relates this, and he says, this is what you and those who know the truth are up against, and um, he, he was, <laughs> he goes on, he's talking about, you know, how he doesn't believe the Torah is done away with and things like this, and uh, his position of end time doctrine, and he said, I told him the fact that Jesus had to die in order for us to be justified, that just much more establishes the law. For if the law could be made of none effect, then he didn't need to die. Of course, they did not like that. And they asked me, well, haven't you ever read the Left Behind series books? <laughs> and, and I said, well, if you look on the binder of those books, it states right on the back, fiction. <laughs> he said, I thought they were going to kill me. And if looks could have killed, I surely would have died that day. So you can see my dilemma. But anyways... I just thought that was kind of interesting. But we need to study. Uh, and so we finally got these books in called Studying the Torah, A Guide to In-Depth Interpretation. They're here, they're now back there. And I think we only got like 25 in, I don't know how many are left, but we got a few of those in. But this is written by a Jewish man and it's a guide to in-depth interpretation. It's how to study the Torah, okay? And I have... Uh, another PowerPoint that kind of goes into some of this, but let me put it up here. Okay, there's an acronym called PARDES, and what you have, the P stands for the Hebrew word PESHAT, which means basically the, just the plain meaning of the text. For example, when it says, don't muzzle the ox that treads the grain, guess what that means? Don't muzzle the ox that treads the grain, okay? Now, you have a remez. A remez is what is considered a hint at another meaning. For example, Rabbi Shaul or Apostle Paul used the phrase, don't muzzle the ox that treads the grain, to basically support the person who's bringing the word to you. Everyone familiar with that? Now, just because he came up with that meaning, does that nullify the other one? And guess what? Now we don't have to muzzle the ox because we found another meaning? Well, that's stupid. But a lot of times that's what the church does. They'll find another meaning for something and think that did away with the plain meaning of the text. You can't do that. Well, then the next one is a drash. And you might've heard the term midrash. And a drash is basically an allegorical meaning that you might find in text, such as Hagar is like Mount Sinai and Sarah is like Mount Zion. Okay, well, that doesn't mean either one of them are mountains. They're just creating an allegory, a drash. So that's another level of meaning. Then lastly, you have what's called the sowed, and that's a hidden meaning. That is where you might look at uh, things that aren't right there on the face of it. You might get into the ancient picture language or into the numerics or into things like that. So there's a, a lot of deep ways to study. But anyway, this book goes into all kinds of things. It's uh, kind of like a, uh, oh, when you go fishing, you got your little fishing kit. Okay, this is going to tell you how to fish, how to study. Okay, this is your toolkit. But anyway, so that's why I wanted to mention that book. Uh, then while I'm mentioning books, I'm not sure when I was going to mention this one, but we also have this one in called Yeshua, A Guide to the Real Jesus and the Original Church. Okay, this book is fantastic. It talks about what the Torah community was like during Yeshua's time. People don't realize that uh, in the synagogue they had deacons and elders it wasn't a new thing that the church started. They were always going on. But anyway, I really recommend this book as well. Okay, and I got three more books I'm gonna mention here. But those are just starters. But I think I'm gonna mention them here in a little bit. Okay, 
the Torah community is one who studies the Torah. Look at Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10. It says, for Ezra had prepared his heart to do what? What a concept. Okay, and that's what we need to do. We need to prepare our heart to seek the Torah. So just studying Torah, you can't just do it on the surface. You've got to prepare your heart when you begin to study and seek the Torah of the Lord. And to what else? To do it. What a concept. Okay, We're, we need to prepare our heart to seek the Torah that we may do it. And to what else? Teach it in Israel, statutes and judgments. And it's so exciting to me when I hear about many of you and many of the people on the internet or emailing us and calling us how they're teach, taking this stuff and they're teaching people. Think about it. This is exciting. You are living at the time of the Super Bowl in history. God has created you for such a time as this. You get to be participating in the game. You don't need to just stand back and watch. You get to be a player. God needed you to do this. And there are people that no one else can reach that you guys can reach. Just, to, just tonight at the back table, a lady was telling me how uh, another lady is reaching a person that no one else could reach and making a difference in their life. I mean, obviously, I can't reach everybody. You guys can't reach everybody. But God knows that everybody that he wanted you to reach for you to reach and to teach. So the Bible is not sufficiently studied unless it results in changed behavior. We do not study to know, we study to do and to become. If the Bible is not changing your life, if, remember the, in the New Testament, from glory to glory, he's changing me. If, if you're not changing from glory to glory, if you're not seeing any change in your life, then you, you need to take a look at it and say, what am I doing wrong? Just like if you're not catching any fish, maybe you need to change bait, okay? And if you don't see any change in your life, there's something in your life that you need, you need to take another look at. And so we also see that the Torah community is organized. We see in Exodus 18, verse 20 and 21, <clears throat> this is where Moses' father-in-law steps in. And he says to Moses, well, you're going to teach them ordinances and Torah. And you shall show them the way where they must walk and they must work that they must do. Moreover, you shall provide out of all the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. When it talks about able men, many of you are familiar with 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, where it talks about, you know, able men, what are the qualifications? Well, he's getting that from Exodus 18, 20, and 21. They need to be able to teach. Now, what I want to do is comment on this next phrase, fear God. You know, when, uh, how many of us know when we think of fear of God, do you think it means to be terrified of? It, that's not what it means. And we're going to look at that more in just a minute. I have on your notes the Hebrew word for fear. But let's look at Proverbs 9.10. It says, well, well, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs 14.26, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. Proverbs 129, they that hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So we see the fear of the Lord is a choice and the opposite is people who hate knowledge. We see in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. We see it's the beginning of wisdom. And if you were to try to find, define the fear of the Lord, what would you say the fear of the Lord is? Hatred of evil? Okay. Well, let's look at what it says here. It says... Uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians 7, 1 first. It says, having therefore these promises, promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Well, I think that's interesting. The fear of God perfects holiness, doesn't it? Well, look at what it says. Proverbs 8, 13 says, this is what the fear of the Lord is. So right here, the Bible is going to define itself. It's going to tell you what the fear of the Lord is, which is the beginning of wisdom. It's to hate evil, to hate pride, arrogancy, and the evil way. The forward mouth is what I hate. 
Do you know the word halal? When I looked it up in the Hebrew, I saw it was halal. It means pride, arrogant, foolish. I just think that's just another one of those interesting things. But I wanted to read to you out of this little book here on uh, fear from a Jewish concept. This is a Jewish understanding of the word fear. Now, let me ask you something. If someone, the very nature of a gift, if I give you something, am I expecting payment for it? Okay, then it's not really a gift, is it? But when you do give somebody something, what do you at least expect back? Thank you. He says, with what the creator gives to each of us is a gift. And gifts require acknowledgement and appreciation, not compensation and not sacrifices. The sacrifices to God are thanksgiving. Psalms 50 verse 14. Now, we're going to talk about Abraham when he was going to offer up Isaac. Okay? In Genesis 22, verse 2, and this is a point that many people don't understand, because in, well, in the King James anyway, God uh, says to Abraham, and he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac. Now, when someone says, take your son, especially when it's God, you see that almost as an imperative. Take your son. But in the Hebrew, it's, would you please? It wasn't a command at all. Okay. And he said, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there for burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you of. Now, you know what Moriah means? Moriah means seen of God or God will show. Now, in Genesis 22, 12, God says to Abraham, lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do you anything unto him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Okay? Now listen to this. Let me go ahead and put up this next clip. There's the Hebrew word for fear. And here's the Hebrew word for see. Okay? Okay? Now, now listen to this. Where it says God fearing may also be be translated as God seeing. Accordingly, Abraham names the place of this event Jehovah Yaira. There's that word Yira, which means that God will see to it. God will reveal or God will see to it. That's the name of it, Jehovah Yira. All right. Now, they have, when the creator said, uh, please take your son, which is the literal translation from the Hebrew, not as it is most commonly rendered, take now your son. It was a request and not a command. As a request, it allowed Abraham room to refuse or to challenge what God said. Now, Deuteronomy 6, 5. Does everyone remember Deuteronomy 6? Shema Yisrael. Okay. And he says, you are to do what? You are to love the Lord your God. It doesn't, the greatest commandment is not to fear the Lord your God. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. Also in Jeremiah 2.2, 2, when God speaks to Israel, he says, I remember your love. He doesn't say, I remember your fear. Now, the Hebrew word for what is translated as fear is spelled the same way as the Hebrew word for seeing. And so therefore it connotes, uh, it's connoting the word for awe really more than fear. So it almost should, rather than the fear of God, think of the awe of God. Awe is responding to what you are seeing. Okay. Fear is the experience of being afraid of something Awe, on the other hand, is a sense of wonder and humility inspired or felt in the presence of mystery. Awe, he continues, does not make us shrink from the awe-inspiring object, but on the contrary, it draws us nearer to it. This is why awe is compatible with both love and joy. 
Remember perfect love, what does it do? Cast out fear. Now, what, this book is quoting another book, and the book is this book that's really good. It's written by another Jewish man, Abraham Joshua Heschel. This one is called God in Search of Man. Rather than man in search of God, God is looking for a man. It's an incredible book. And he also, along as I am mentioning him, wrote another book. If you want to understand the concept of Sabbath from a Jewish perspective, that is, the concepts are mind-blowing. Abraham Joshua Heschel also wrote this book called The Sabbath. I highly recommend this book too. We don't have either of these books in our bookstore, but you can get them both online. Abraham Joshua Heschel, H-E-S-C-A-T-L, The Sabbath and God in Search of Man, both incredible books. But anyway, think about this. Did Job fear God? And yet he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He had a relationship with God. Now listen to this. I thought this was incredible. When you love someone, you intend always to fulfill their wishes the best way you possibly can. So that there would be no gap in the love flow between you and them. And because of this, you will likewise be cautious about disregarding their wishes altogether, even about a minor matter. matter. Let me give you a perfect example. How many of you like a latte? I mean, some people, they want it, I want it. A, let me see, an extra hot, double, you know, Irish cream, you know, extra shot, and all of this kind of stuff, coffee. You know what I'm talking about? Light, non-fat, sweet, all this stuff. Okay, now, if I love this person who I am getting this for, I am fearful of getting it wrong. Okay, but it's, the fear is not terror, but it's like, because I love this person so much, I want to make sure that I get all the details right. I'm afraid of getting it wrong because I love the person. Not because I'm afraid of the person. That's what he's trying to say in this book. He's trying to say the fear of God is more of an awe of God. And you love this person so much, you're not afraid in the sense of fear. You're afraid of messing it up. Are you following me? <clears throat> he goes, sadly, <clears throat> well-meaning religious teachers have all but played on that naive fear for the purpose of keeping us in line. But to some, it's more important that the people not be so hard on themselves by presuming that God demanded perfection of them and flawless service. Rather, serve God like the son who serves his father, that is, with joy and ease, saying, hey, even if I don't get it right, he won't be angry with me because he's my father. And that is how we're supposed to be relating to God. It's not like, well, let me explain how he says it here. I thought this was great. How many of you know, psychologically, we tend to accommodate those from whom we need something? Or of whom we're afraid of. We will go out of our way to pay them homage and attention. For too long, this very human kind of projection has painted an image of the creator as some cosmic loan shark who will break our legs or harm our loved ones if we don't cough up some protection money in the form of personal sacrifices or religious observances. But that is not the way of the Jewish thinker. They begin with an outright shattering of this kind of image, introducing instead the God who owes us nothing and yet is always giving to us. I owe no creature anything, God says, yet when a person performs a positive deed or a mitzvot, I reward them gratuitously, for I owe every creature absolutely nothing. God owes us nothing, but he gives us everything. And even though when we do something, it's not, okay, now, God, you pay me for what I've done. There's no way we can pay back God. God doesn't owe us. He never will owe us. So the whole concept of the commandments isn't to earn the salvation. It never was. It was our, that's what's our duty to do because everything God's given to us. Now, isn't that important to realize it like that? 
Uh, in Genesis 22, 14, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And so there you see the same word for fear as seen. Okay, uh, lastly, it's a community of righteousness. That's at least lastly this week. Next week we'll continue with more. But let's look at how the Torah is to be a righteous community. We'll start with Deuteronomy 4, 8. And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments that are so righteous as all of this Torah, which I said before you this day. So here we see the Torah is completely righteous. All the statutes, the judgments, they're righteous. Look at Psalms 37, 30 and 31. <clears throat> the mouth of the righteous speak wisdom and his tongue talks of judgment. And why does his mouth speak righteously and wisdom? And he speaks of judgment because the Torah of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Boy, if you don't want your steps to slide, what do we need to do? Put the Torah in our heart. <clears throat> Psalm 119.7, I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned your righteous judgment. So here we see the judgments of God are righteous. Matter of fact, in verse 144 of Psalm 119, it says, the righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I will live. So here we see not only the judgments, but the testimonies also are righteous and they are, and how long do they last? Okay, they haven't been gone the last 2,000 years. It's still true. Pro uh, Proverbs 11:28. Now, I don't know how many of you were here on Saturday morning when I talked about the rich young ruler. Look at Proverbs 11:28. He that trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish as a branch. <clears throat> here it says in Psalm 12:5, the thoughts of the righteous, they're right. That's why in, it says, think on these things. And then Brit Hadashah. Proverbs 13, 5, that the righteous man hates lying. Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous studies to give the answer. But the mouth of the wicked just pours out evil things. Proverbs 21, 26, he that he coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous, what do they do? They give and spare not. Proverbs 28, 1, the wicked flee when no one even pursues, but the righteous are what? They're as bold as a lion. Okay. Think about this. Remember what it says? Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and what? He will flee from you. So many people are fleeing from the devil. They don't realize the devil will flee from you. How would you like when you go around the devil says, oh no, here comes Joe. I'm out of here. <laughs> That's the way it's supposed to be, guys. The I am not afraid of the devil. He's afraid of me. We need to be bold as a lion. Proverbs 29, 7. The righteous, what else do they do? They consider the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to even know it. So a Torah community is going to be a righteous community, and they're going to have these kind of attributes. They're going to care for people. They're going to care for the poor. They're going to care for the elderly. They're going to care for everybody. And isn't it nice to know that you can be part of a community? You're not alone. I think it's so important, especially for the people that are internet that are listening right now, to know you are not alone. You know, we are here for you. And uh, why don't all of you guys give the internet people a big hand, let them know that uh, we're all one big community. <clears throat> you know, I, I can't help but think of the soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. We get hits from all over the world. Even Arab countries, we get hits. And, uh, but our hearts are always for the people. Uh, those of you that were here on Shabbat, did you like that story of the rabbi who helped all the hundreds of families <laughs> and nobody knew? And we need to be that kind of people. We need to go out of our way. I tell you what, I mean, uh, this, uh, like I said, there's different ways of giving. And, and uh, I think one of the important ways of giving is giving a kind word. It really is. And, you know, it's kind of amazing. I had made the comment how people on the, you know, I get all kinds of emails. You know, believe me, I get a lot of grief emails as well as good emails. Like I said the other day, I mean, some people think I'm the Antichrist, you know. I mean, I get it all. And, uh, but anyway, since I mentioned that on the Internet, I've been getting emails. We love you, Pastor Mark. And I've been getting <laughs> cards and all this stuff. 
<laughs> and uh, I appreciate all the uh, emails and cards, and I know I'm appreciated. I want everyone to know that I appreciate you, and I just thank you guys for coming. So let's stand and we'll close with prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah. We thank you so much for your word and I pray, Lord, you would just plant this deep in each one of our hearts that we would be a righteous community, a Torah following community. We would help one another when we fall and we would not judge one another. But Father, we would just realize that, uh, you know, but by the grace of God, there go us and that we would just learn how to help one another and pick each other up, befriend one another and even drop little notes without signing it, letting people know that God is there with them and encouraging them. And we just thank you so much. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's pastormark at elshadiministries.us. Be blessed and shalom.